Thank you. <coughs> so this is uh, joint work with, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. I'm really happy to he be here. And I'm uh, going to talk about uh, joint work with uh, Luis Escariaza and uh, Gregory Sergin. So uh, let's look at uh, the, uh, so we consider the usual setting Navier, Navier Stokes equation and here are some facts which uh, everybody in this room knows that uh, we have this uh, scaling symmetry on of the Navier Stokes and if you look at the um, LP norms which are invariant under the scaling so if you ta take the spatial LP spaces it's LN and space time in space time we have uh, these spaces and uh, it's a well-known fact going back to Lare that uh, that uh, Navier Stokes is locally well posed in LP for p above the critical critical exponent, and in fact we have this uh, estimate on the blow-up rate. So uh, let's see. In the 80s, Cato proved that, uh, that the equation is also locally well posed in uh, LN. Um, and here the maximal time of existence, uh, its dependence on the initial data coming from the proof if, is more subtle than on just on the norm. It depends uh, on uh, the distribution of uh, the norm, so to speak. And uh, I'm mentioning that because it will come up in uh, what I'll be talking about. So the, the question uh, which uh, we addressed in, in our work is if you can have singularities while this uh, critical norm remains bounded, the spatial critical norm uh, remains bounded. So I should say right away, again as everybody knows here, that there is no uh, a priori estimate of that norm in, in three dimensions. So uh, it the interest of this question is uh, somewhat, in this question, is somewhat limited, but uh, it still has some interesting uh, applications. One is uh, if we look at uh, self-similar solutions. So the simplest, uh, the simplest singularities in Navier-Stokes would be self-similar singularities, already suggested by Lerae in uh, 1934. And uh, we get an equation like that for capital U. And uh, this is a particular case. So Lare suggested uh, to look for solutions of this with U in W12. So this would be a particular case which would give us L3 infinity singularity. But in fact, uh, <coughs> we have a much better result than that on uh, this particular equation in the whole space. Uh, Tsai in 1998 ruled out pretty much uh, any reasonable solution of uh, this equation. But there is a slight modification of this where things are not settled. So the, we take the Lare equation and we add some uh, artificial time to that so we can view it now as a time dependent problem with Lare solution as uh, steady state solutions of this uh, of this uh, equation, and uh, we can now ask, say, for example, does this equation has solutions which are periodic in tau? So that's a very hard question, which is, uh, in general, it's it's not clear whether or not this is the case. And uh, if we have such a tau periodic solution, then this again produces uh, produces a singularity for. Navier Stokes. So, the uh, if uh, because of the scale invariance, if we have a if we have a solution capital U, which is a top periodic solution of uh, of this uh, slightly generalized Lerae equation, then it will produce again L infinity 
L3 singularity. It's, uh, the, it seems there is no direct proof of, uh, of ruling out L infinity Ln solution of this periodic Intel solution of uh, this equation. There is, uh, it's not now, at least I don't know any proof which would rule it out directly. The, uh, in the end, it can be ruled out by, by the indirect argument that, uh, that these solutions, these singularities do not exist. So uh, another, another interesting, interesting thing about the self-similar singularities is when you look at possible self-similar singularities at boundaries, say in a half space, then uh, the Tsai's method of proving that the equation, that the original array equation does not have a solution doesn't apply at all because it uses a maximum principle and we don't have estimates for the pressure at the boundary. So at the boundary, uh, actually, uh, it's not clear even if the, if the original simple self-similar singularities exist or not. And so this will, s what, uh, if we know L, infinity Ln singularities do not exist, that again settles a special case for that uh, situation. So let's, let me remind you, again I sh maybe should apologize because if everybody in the room knows this, but I, I thought it's uh, since uh, the, um, it will place important role in the, in the, pro in the sketch of the proof, I, I try to go very briefly, it's through the standard regularity theory for Navier-Stokes. In uh, the version which is uh, often used uh, in geometric analysis, uh, which, is, uh, which will work for our purposes here quite well. So the, it has basically two, two parts. So we uh, denote by QR this parabolic ball of uh, radius r. And then we have one ingredient is the linear estimate for the, uh, for the equations, which uh, essentially tells us that if we have a solution in this parabolic unit ball, which is everywhere bounded by one, then we can bound the gradient essentially by one also, modulo some constant. Okay? So in particular, what this says that if u is uh, everywhere less than uh, one in, in this parabolic unit ball, then it's, also, it's bigger, say, than one half in uh, some area around zero, which can be uniformly estimated. So I wrote Q one half, but uh, completely precisely is Q rho with some fixed row, which does not depend on the solution. So, the, so the, the important thing is that this area where the function attains maximum, that before it drops to less than the maximum, uh, you, you have an estimate on that from linear estimate for the, for the uh, Stokes equation. So now what we do, we, we scale, we just scale this estimate, use the scale invariance of the equation, and we, we scale this estimate. So this will tell us something about, about how the possible peaks of the solution look like, so pe peaks of the modulus of uh, velocity. So I assume that I'm approaching a, a blow-up point and viscosity, I mean, and, and the modulus of velocity goes to infinity, and I'm looking at the, the peaks of uh, modulus of viscosity. And this, if you scale the above estimate, this, uh, this linear estimate, you get that, that peaks, you, you can quantitatively estimate, estimate how massive the peaks have to be. And the, roughly speaking, modulo constants is that if you have a peak of height m, it has to be at least 1 over m wide, okay? So uh, before you, in other words, before you, before you drop to m over 2, you have to go at least uh, 1 over m in distance from the center of the peak. So that's uh, kind of, is a quantitative uh, description of the intuitively obvious thing that viscosity doesn't allow thin peaks. That if, if the, the, a peak would be too thin, it would be smoothed out by viscosity. And this is, uh, 
this is the lower bound on the mass of the peak which you have to have to, uh, to get uh, a blow up. Let's see. And there is a similar thing in uh, space time. So before I, I looked at uh, the peaks just in space, you have a similar thing in space time which says that if you have this peak of height m, uh, then it has to, okay, it has to be at least 1 over m wide and it has to last for at least 1 over m squared time units. So uh, if you go back to these, uh, to these uh, invariant, to these uh, scale invariant spaces, you use these estimates on, on these peaks, you see that, that the, uh, if you have a singularity, you concentrate cr a critical norm. It means if you, if you write, say, the L5 norm, one of the critical norms, it will create, as you approach the singularity, it, it will create Dirac mass in space-time. Okay? So this uh, immediately shows you, uh, gives you, for example, the classic uh, criterion that if U is in this space, you have uh, regularity. The key thing being here that if you are under these conditions, if Q is bigger than N, you are in the scale invariant space and U is here, then the finiteness of the norm, if the norm is finite, it really means that it's locally small. That's the, and if it is locally small, it doesn't allow concentration. So that's, uh, in a sense, uh, the idea behind the, the proof of, uh, of this regularity. So the case, the, the end point, so to speak, of, of this scale, L infinity in time, Ln in space, is different because finiteness of this norm does not imply that the norm is locally small. So that's the only difficulty in the proof. Otherwise, all standard regularity tricks apply. This is the only obstacle to, to the proof. So the, here is an example, a trivial example. If uh, you take compactly supported U, A goes to zero, you see the concentration here. Now, what this uh, says that if you potentially approach, uh, I mean, if you approach a potential blow up time, uh, T max, then the solution is, is regular unless you create some Dirac masses here, unless you have some concentration here. So singularity necessarily in this case implies that this will create some Dirac masses. And since you have uh, well-posedness in the critical space, so if the norm, roughly speaking, if the norm is sufficiently small, you know everything is fine, then you, you have to have a lower bound on these. Okay? These has to have a certain size which you can estimate from below. So in particular, if this is finite, you have an estimate on this from below. You see you can have only finitely many singularities. And also you see that what, what is happening at a, uh, at a singularity is that the LN norm becomes discontinuous. You lose these, uh, at the singularity, you lose these Dirac masses, you lose this part of the norm, so the LN norm at such a singularity will drop by this amount, by the sum of these CI. So, If we uh, focus now on one of these finitely many singularities, say which is uh, which is at uh, zero, then we we uh, try to watch it carefully under a microscope, so to speak. So we we will tr start rescaling it to with lambda going to zero, okay. and. Uh, Again, the, uh, the difficulty is that, uh, that this norm, even as you rescale, stays essentially constant, does not go to zero. So the, the key observation for, for our method is that if you, if you look at the, so the norm L infinity Ln does not scale to, to zero as you scale. But if you look at the blow up profile, that means the, uh, which is well-defined because of partial regularity, you know that the uh, law profile is well-defined. Then this actually does 
uh, become locally small as, as you scale it. Because it's in LN, you, f you scale it at a fixed time, okay, and LN norm, if, if it's finite, it is locally small. So this, as you, as you scale it, it is becoming locally small. Okay, so in other words, uh, the small scale picture of the situation at the potential singularity is this, that you have, uh, here you have the concentration of the norm as, you, as you're approaching the singularity, if you look at the, at the very small scale, the uh, norm concentrates here, okay, cre creating almost a Dirac mass here, but if you look at the actual time when the singularity occurs, then the solution is very close to zero in L3 norm. So it, uh, the BOA profile is almost zero. So we will now try to use this to, to prove regularity. And essentially, one way, to th one way to think about it is that we are trying to reverse the standard argument uh, in regularity theory. So the standard situation is this. If you have some ball where you have a, a norm of, a, say, initial data, which are small in the critical space, then you have well posedness so you, you can maybe modulo some questions uh, about locality, which uh, usually are okay. Maybe you can then say that, uh, that the solution is good for small time. Okay, following in the neighborhood of, uh, of uh, that ball. Okay, so f moving forward from your data, the solution is good. So what we will try to do in our, in our situation, we will try to reach the same situation, but going backwards. That we assume that the solution arrived at some time level here and is small in this norm. And we try to make a conclusion that actually it could not have been big here. Otherwise, some, some of this kind of uh, non-smallness condition would have survived in the blow-up, okay? So that's, uh, that's the idea. One, of course, has to be a little cautious here because, for example, this, if, you, if you do this argument for the two-dimensional harmonic map heat flow, you see for the two-dimensional harmonic map heat flow, it, that's exactly what happens. You, you, here you have zero and here you have, uh, here you have blow-up. So it's, uh, not true for every equation, but uh, even for the harmonic mob, mob heat flow, if you do the analysis, we are going to, it gives you some information about the, how the singularity has to look like. So the, um, what uh, we will do is we, we just look at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, singularity, and then we uh, rescale, as uh, I was uh, showing before, and then we take lambda to zero. So you, you really uh, rescale everything to so that you look at it at uh, uh, in the immediate neighborhood on the sing of the singularity only, and that's so now. Here we, uh, to, to pass to the limit here in this rescaling, that's where we have to use pretty much uh, most, of, most of the regularity theory, which is uh, for Navier-Stokes. The, um, the most difficult part in this, in this procedure, so it's easy to get compactness, uh, that you can pass, uh, you, you pass the subsequence, you get some kind of limit. Um, and the, uh, th one of the main points is that unless you did not have a singularity, unless the original solution was regular, then this limit is non-zero. So that's where you really have to use uh, a lot of the, uh, the non-regularity theory. Another important thing for us will be that, and I will have a picture of the situation on, on the next slide, is that you, that you have some control on the possible singular points of this blow-up, U bar. That they cannot be, if you fix some time, they cannot be distributed, th they cannot go up to infinity. They can only, the possible singularities of this blow-up solution can only be concentrated in a finite ball for a fixed time. Okay. And then uh, the, uh, 
the smallness of L the local smallness of L3 norm in after the blow up becomes just that u bar is identically zero at the blow up time. It's a, it's a, that's a property of any LP norm for P bigger than one and less than infinity. If the norm is finite, it's locally small. So if you're rescaling something, it's becoming a Dirac map. And the, and no, I'm, I'm rescaling it at the, at the blow up profile. So at that point. Okay. Okay. Right. So it's the asymptotic attribute. Yes, yes. So here is the uh, overview of uh, the solution which you get after the blow up. So here we don't really care much about what is happening for some, we fix some time, capital, say minus capital T, and we have some region, some, some compact region in space where you potentially can have some singularities. There is uh, still a singularity at the origin. But the important thing coming from partial regularity theory that essentially that the smallness of LN norm gives you regularity is that if you go sufficiently far out there are no singularities away from this ball here okay and that the solution is identically zero at time zero okay so that's the situation so, so now you see that it started starting to look that uh, this uh, should not really uh, be possible that you s here you have some, uh, some non-zero solution and you, you drive it maybe through some singularities, but they are kind of uh, singularities which are in some sense under a lot of control. And then the solution becomes identically zero. So uh, the conjecture is you cannot really have such a situation. And the, uh, a good way of doing this is to pass now to the uh, vorticity equation because the uh, Navier-Stokes is non-local uh, so it's it's better to deal with an equation which is more local which is the the vorticity equation and uh, in fact we will forget that uh, u comes from Navier-Stokes we will just consider this as a, as a coefficient and omega as a coefficient so we will now really look just at the linear equation for vorticity, which is essentially a heat equation with lo some lower order terms. And the, uh, all we need about these terms is that they are bounded, which is, I mean, they are not bounded in Rn because then uh, the, we would have a trivial problem. But uh, the non-triviality of the problem is that they are only bounded away from this finite region. So we will consider this equation only in the complement of the finite ball where we no longer have singularities. And there indeed you can consider these guys in the vorticity equation as L infinity coefficient. So now the question is, now the conjecture is that in this situation if you have such a solution of the heat equation in the complement of a ball which is say bounded, has bounded coefficients here, we hope that it cannot become identically zero. And it's a, in some sense, it's a close call because uh, for a bounded uh, domain, it is not true. If, uh, so here is a little warning from uh, control theory that uh, if you do it on a, on a bounded domain, so our, we have a bounded domain, QT now is a bounded domain times some inter uh, times interval and we look at the uh, heat equation and for this purpose of this counterexample we can even forget we have coefficients here just look at the heat equation then the uh, standard statement in control theory is you take initial data uh, here and you can then find g at the boundary so that you drive it in zero in finite time so that's exactly what would kill our, our method. If this is possible in uh, our domain, then uh, our, our method is, uh, is doomed. So uh, the, the difference uh, between what we have and this uh, control theory example 
is that uh, that we have an infinite domain in uh, in that example. So let me convince you on this uh, slide that that for the heat equation in an uh, in in this case actually there is no no difference in difficulty between one dimension and higher dimensions. So I, I'll just concentrate on, on one dimension. If I have a heat equation on this half space, so this is x is bigger than zero, this is uh, positive t, and I, I'll, I'll try this thought experiment that I, that I first disturb. Okay, I start from zero, zero initial condition, and then I will disturb it uh, at the boundary by some boundary condition. Okay, and then I decide, after a, a while running this boundary condition, I decide I want to drive it back to zero. So in a, in finite domain, that's possible. Uh, you can first disturb it and then drive it back to zero. So now I claim that uh, in infinite domain, in, in half space, it is not possible. That, uh, that you can, once you disturb it, there is no way you can drive it back to zero. And the reason you can see on this, uh, on a, simple Fourier transform argument. So assume we have such a situation that we, that we start with uh, zero data then, uh, and have some non-zero disturbance here so that it eventually becomes zero. So we write everything. We now start thinking about u as a function defined everywhere in space, in all space, and f also in space, and apply the heat operator. So what, is, what happens is that the heat operator on this u will generate, okay, I should have said that we extend it as an even function to the whole space, okay, to the other, other half. And then if you, uh, so the, across this uh, region, the function is smooth. It's also smooth across this region. So the only thing where the function is not smooth will be across this, uh, across the time axis. And there, if you apply the heat operator on that, if you extend it, it as an even function, it will produce uh, this right-hand side, okay? So now you apply Fourier transform to everything. You get uh, this equation. And the important thing is that, that uh, this function is compactly supported in space. Therefore, the Fourier transform is analytic. And in fact, this function also is compactly supported, I mean, in time, I should have said in time, the Fourier transform of this is compactly supported in time, so it's also in space, but it's, uh, I'm t it's analytic in time, the Fourier transformation, and uh, the same is true here. So in fact, these functions which I have here are analytic in time, so I can set in this equation, I can set tau is equal to ix i squared, and I saw that, that the Fourier transform of f has to vanish on the imaginary axis, and therefore it has to be zero. So this shows me that uh, the linear, for the linear heat equation, I cannot really drive it to zero uh, as I can do in, in a bounded domain. So now if you push this uh, Fourier transform argument, you can, in fact, without much uh, work, incorporate initial data. So you, any bounded initial data, you can prove essentially along the same lines that any bounded initial data you cannot drive to identical zero. Now, the, uh, in, uh, in our situation, the, the issue is that, uh, that we have these uh, perturb, the, these uh, lower order terms, which, uh, with uh, which it is not clear how to, how to use the, uh, the Fourier uh, analysis or analytic continuation method. So the, the only thing which we could uh, think about was to, to use uh, Karlman inequalities, to the, the technique of Karlman inequalities to, to give us the same result. I will not really go much into details of it. I, I will show you the inequalities on the next slide, but I just want to, uh, to formulate the, the result. So the result is, is that the statement about the backward uniqueness we need is actually true. That the solution, if it even if you add these uh, lower order terms with L infinity coefficient, that you can get the same conclusion as for the heat equation. So 
here is the Karman inequalities which we which we use. Um, so there are two inequalities here for that. Um, so the notation is that gamma is, is the heat kernel, epsilon is uh, some fixed number, and sigma is uh, this particular function. Uh, so the, the first inequality, which is C1 here, one should really think about, or at least uh, I, I think it's good to think about it as, a, as, a, as this one, which is not quite true, but uh, it's a fix to, 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 this, uh, to this inequality. So you try to estimate, you, th this is the, the heat kernel here, and uh, you, you try to estimate, you, an expression like that, so notice that everything is scale invariant, that, if you, th that uh, if you scale the solution as a heat equation, everything is scale invariant. If you want a scale invariant quantity with this weight here, you don't have much choice. This is pretty much the, 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 the <coughs> only uh, reasonable thing, or at least one of the few things you, you can write down. Um, but the... Uh, so, so the, the key thing is that this should be true for, for, all, for all positive numbers A. Uh, the constant should not depend on A. The, the problem with this inequality is that it, it fails. The, the main reason for failure is this guy. That, uh, that uh, it, it is almost true if you incorporate only this guy here, then uh, for a suitable values of A it is true. But, but this guy kills this inequality. It's, it's not true. But, uh, but it can be, one can quite well understand why it is not true and therefore it can be fixed. Uh, in this, so you have to, what you have to do, you have to change the, the weight a little bit here, which is uh, a trick which is also fine. It's, it's an old trick which is uh, in, uh, already was used in elliptic equations. It's for example in the Hermander book that you, if you change the weight from t to, to this, you, you get a little convexity. And uh, then you have to give up the, uh, the scale invariance. So you, you have to give up some power here. Okay? And then the inequality is true. And uh, that is one thing which uh, is used in the proof. And then the other inequality, is, uh, that's kind of a more or less, uh, it's a, along standard lines in this uh, Karlman inequality. Uh, methods that we have a weight like that. Uh, this is the time at which the solution becomes zero. This is the weight. And then we have, uh, again, a similar thing. We try to make it as much scale invariant as possible. And uh, this one is actually easier than, than this one. For sure. So if uh, you use this and, and standard techniques from, uh, from Karman inequalities and from unique continuation, then you can actually prove that uh, the solution uh, has to be identically zero. So um, the related uh, questions, which uh, we don't know how to do, is, is the following. So one, one thing which uh, one can ask if the actually the the limit of the LN norm is infinite at the, at the singularity, which is the case if we are in the case where P is strictly bigger than N, then we know actually that if we have LN plus epsilon, we know that this has to go to infinity. And in fact, we have a rate of blow up at uh, bounded from below at which uh, this has to happen. Our proof does not give that this, uh, this norm at a potential singularity goes to infinity. It only says that lim sup goes to infinity. So uh, that's, uh, that's one thing. Then the uh, more interesting question is to try to uh, look at concentration of L2 norm, but that's uh, unfortunately completely, completely out of uh, uh, reach of uh, the methods because we, uh, because, uh, we don't have uh, scale invariance in that case. But the, uh, the thing would be, okay, we, again, the question would be that can this, say if t max is again a singular time, so one can 
ask if this mapping is continuous at the singularity time. It is known, and an easy consequence of partial regularity, that in fact is any norm less than two is continuous. So here, the, again, the only possible effect which uh, can prevent continuity is concentration about uh, at a singular set. And we know that the singular set has to have Hausdorff dimension, the, um, the one-dimensional Hausdorff measure is zero. But even in the simplest case where we, where we just consider one singular point, it's, it's not clear how to rule out uh, that the L2 norm would concentrate at, uh, at one point. This is related to uniqueness of weak solutions. I think if you, if you have that the L2 norm can concentrate at one point, then uh, uh, it's uh, a step towards non-uniqueness. Non there are still man, m more things that would have to happen, but certainly concentration of L2 norm is, is one of them. Um, it's, uh, one can rule it out by completely standard argument. If U is in L4 of space-time, then the L2 norm cannot concentrate. That's a standard uh, argument. Then the... Uh, The, the real interesting singularities, unfortunately, are not the ones wh which would be produced by L with bounded L3 norms. The, the real interesting singularities are these, that, uh, that uh, you would have, uh, you would have a blow up rate like that, that it would be 1 over x in space and 1 over square root of uh, t minus t in time. So that's consistent, the same rate of blow up as one has for uh, self-similar solutions. But of course, we would not assume self-similar, just this bound. And then the, the task would be a rule out this if you have this rule out the singularity under this assumption. So in particular, the blow-up profile looks like a minus one homogeneous function, but uh, it's close to L3, just misses L3, but the method completely breaks down. Doesn't work at all because uh, this does not become small as you rescale it. Um, so the only exception where I can handle these uh, singularities is actually the, the work of Tsai on self-similar singularities. So self-similar singularities can, with this uh, blow-up rate, can be ruled out. That's uh, in Tsai's work. However, if the self-similar singularity with this rate of blow-up is at the boundary, it's not, it's not clear what, uh, what happens. So that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you.